Hi everyone, welcome to continued coverage of HDFC Bank results. HDFC results are now out. I went through the presentations, the results. In this video, I'll highlight some of the key points which will be very useful to you if you are planning to invest in HDFC Bank or if you are an existing investor. The topics we'll cover, update on foreign holdings, which is the FIA holding, a DIA misconception that all of us have and we invest under that misconception. Where is HDFC in HDFC Bank? the official subsidiary list, how they are doing. In the previous video, I said that other investments will perhaps do better than the core business. We'll double check that point. And also I'll give you an overview of the results, the key points. Let's get started. For the first point, which is related to FII holdings, let me jump to HDFC's investor presentation. FIIs clearly hold the maximum stake at 41.7%. This graph also shows that ADR, which is the American listing, has 13.5% weightage on the overall pie. This number is usually not shown on the domestic sites. Mutual funds are the second biggest holders at 20%, individuals 13%. But this graph does not show the complete story. For that, let's jump to screener promoters. So July of 2023 was when HDFC Limited merged into HDFC Bank. This is the line. After that, there is no concept of promoter. FIIs, they had 33% stake in June of 2023. That increased to 52% because FIIs owned a lot in HDFC, not in HDFC bank initially. That remained same till December. After that, this number has gone down by roughly 5%. This is what I was talking about. FIIs have been continuously selling in the last quarter. Who's buying that? DIIs, 26% to 33% public. It was 14% pre-merger, is 18.6% now. So clearly FIIs have reduced their stake by nearly 5% and most of that has been bought by DIIs and public. The biggest DIIs are LIC and SBI. Let's go to the next point, DIA misconception. There are two key categories of institutional investors, FII and DIA. FII again have two categories, investors and traders. Investors are in for the longer haul. They buy typically few percentage like 3 or 4, 10%, 5% in the company and they stay for a longer term. They don't buy and sell today just like the trader FIIs. The traders buy in cash, they buy in options, they use the equity market to make money in a quick time. DIIs again are of two categories, investors and traders. The biggest investors are LIC and SBI. They just buy that usually never sell. Then there are a lot of mutual funds who invest for longer term. But there are a lot of mutual funds who also trade. Many mutual funds don't just buy and hold it for the long term, which we typically think they are doing. A lot of us have SIPs running for years. What we think is since we are putting money regularly, say HDFC bank, mutual funds are also buying that over time. And hence the holding price is very good. But mutual funds also sell what they hold. They have a pulse of the market. If they feel that the stock will fall, they sell it. If they think it will go up, they buy it. So effectively, if you are thinking of long term, you are still probably in the hands of traders in many, many mutual funds. So rethink about your strategy because mutual funds also have one problem. During panic selling, when a lot of people try to escape and want to dump their mutual fund holdings, mutual funds are also forced to sell whatever they hold at market prices. What that means is if market is down 10% and there is a lot of redemption pressure on mutual funds, they'll have to sell the good stuff also when it is down significantly 10, 15, 20%. They will not have cash to service all the redemption requests. Let's now try and figure out where is HDFC limited in HDFC bank. For this, I'll take a small example where I'll try to show you how a typical merger like HDFC bank and HDFC happens in terms of share pricing and share transfer. Let me jump to Excel for that. For this example, let's imagine there are two companies, A and B, which are going to merge. A has 1000 shares, B has 800 shares. EPS for company A is 100 rupees and earning per share for B is 60 rupees. Now between PE and share price, it is a chicken or egg situation. What comes first, PE or share price? Let me answer that in an example way. When a company goes for an IPO, it offers a price band to the shareholders. For example, 80 to 100 rupees. Investors like us decide what price you want to subscribe at and that becomes the starting price. After that, the price divided by the earnings, which is the EPS, becomes the PE ratio. A company that grows fast after IPO typically is associated with a high PE and the share price as a result grows faster and vice versa. 
let's say the p of this company a is 20 and p of company b is 25 you might be guessing which one is hdfc and hdfc bank so a is hdfc bank b is hdfc hdfc was the holding company it used to have a higher p and a higher growth rate than hdfc bank the share price is a function of eps and p it comes to p into eps 2000 rupees for share a and 1500 for share b now these companies decide to merge so we already know the total shares both of them have we know their eps so there's a share swap which is done now since company a is merging with b the shareholders of b will get shares of a b will be delisted now how will it happen if we the share price for every four shares of b which is worth six thousand rupees there will be three shares of a which will again be worth six thousand rupees so shareholders of company b who have four shares will get three shares of company a they will have same money in the bank on the day the merger becomes effect now in the combined entity a plus b based upon the known shares and eps the new numbers are it's a simple mathematics shares become 1600 because of share swap 800 became 600 so 1000 plus 600 eps again gets prorated the eps of the combined entity reduces to 92.5 compared to eps of a but it is higher than eps of b obviously let's say the market says that since a was growing slowly and b was growing fast so the p will be somewhere in between 22 so the new share price is 2035 which means it is better than of the first company but on a prorated basis it is a loss for the shareholders of b on 1st of july all shareholders of hdfc and hdfc bank ended up with hdfc bank shares the price based upon the ratios nearly remained same initially after that market will decide whether to take it up or down which means the p will go up or down let's check that on the graphs now back to screener p ratio for last one year so 1st of july is when the merger became active right now around 17 the stock price also post merger has gone down then went up a bit but it is down significantly which means the market is regarding the merger to be less valuable than hdfc bank was initially before the merger hope that clarifies on the stock price despite a large company like hdfc getting into hdfc bank via the mna let's now talk about other investments so i'm looking at the consolidated financial results always look at consolidated not standalone because that will include the results of all subsidiaries interest earned which is the core business of the bank total interest increased from 78000 crore to 79000 crore approximately slightly more than 1% increase other income meanwhile increased from 37000 crore to 45000 crore which is nearly 16% jump this is what i meant when i said other income will contribute a lot more to the results than the core business total income obviously includes 1 plus 2 both that shows 1 lakh 15 thousand increasing to 1 lakh 24 thousand note that in this 9 thousand only 1 thousand was contributed by the core business this is one concern i have that the core business of the bank is not growing that fast Meanwhile, their subsidiaries, other investments, they are growing a lot faster. But the maximum cost is being incurred in the main bank, which is not growing fast enough. Let's now go through the official subsidiary list and how the subsidiaries are doing. I talked about HDB in the video. I talked about HDFC Securities in the video. HDFC Life and HDFC AMC are already listed companies. HDB Financial Services, 95% stake held by a bank. Loan book up 29% year on year. So it's a good business growing faster than the bank remember i told you about microfinance having higher margins net interest margin of 7.6 percent this is way way higher than what the bank earns in general so hdb is a more profitable business slightly more riskier as well but for stakeholders that generates better returns hdfc life is already listed you can go through the results separately hdfc amc also is listed hdfc ergo 50.5 percent stake held by bank remaining by ergo there is a net loss of 1.3 billion compared to profit of 2.1 billion in the prior year. So this business is clearly not doing that well. HDFC Securities, net revenue up 77%, net profit up 64% year on year, earning per share of 200 rupees. Remember I talked about HDFC Securities being a good business considering the growth in this segment. This too is growing a lot better than the bank. Now I'll walk you through some of the important points that caught my eyes while reviewing the documents which HDFC has released. 
on the left side i have the previous financial year on the right side i have the current financial year q4 one thing which i get suspicious about all the time is if in one period the reporting is done in crores and in the next period it is done in billions for today just multiply by 100 the numbers on the right side so 23350 crores became 29000 crores growth of 23.7% became 24.5% that is despite the very high margins of HDFC now getting merged into HDFC bank. Fees and commission income grew by 20.6% compared to 17.7%. Net profit was 12,000 crores here. This was 16,500 crores here. This may sound like a big increase, but this includes the profit from HDFC and all businesses owned by HDFC, which is now being reported with HDFC bank. Total deposits. 18,83,000 crores, 2,37,000 crores. This is a good healthy jump in the deposits of the bank. This is the critical part. Core net interest margin 4.3% reduced to 3.6%, which means the margins are under pressure. This is what the market will not like at all. This should actually have increased because the interest margin of HDFC was higher. This is a key metric that investors look at. Capital adequacy ratio more or less in line okay. Gross NPAs have increased 1.12 to 1.24. Markets will punish this. CASA, I talked about this in the previous video. 44% contribution in the overall funds that bank raise has reduced to 38%. 6% additional money has to be raised by a bank additionally. The money is not coming from banks customers as CASA balances. CASA deposits 11.3% contribution. Term deposits 30% contribution. Let's check what this is right now. This ratio has reduced to 38.2% from 44.4%. Term deposits have gone up March quarter. This was down a lot 30% in March 23 when bank was not paying a good interest rate. After that, the interest rate has increased several times and that is why investors are renewing their interest in term deposits. People contributed 10% by keeping money in their saving banks earlier. They are now just keeping 6.4% in the SB, which means people are investing the money separately, not keeping too much money in the bank. Even current account deposits, 14.3% has reduced slightly to 13.4%. This is the CASA problem I was talking about in the previous video. At that time, I didn't have access to the numbers, but these are the published numbers. Overall net interest margin and gross NPA number is something markets will not like tomorrow at all. Over the course of next few days, as this number becomes more clear to the investors, the stock may fall a lot. Now let's see what the bank is saying in terms of performance numbers. Deposits increased 1.66 trillion in the quarter. Retail deposits grew, deposits increase, advances grow, asset quality continues to remain stable. GNPA ratio at 1.24%. They have not said that it has worsened in the highlights. Consolidated EPS 23.2. So the bad news has not been given in the performance metrics or the key highlights at all. Again, key financial parameters, net interest margin 3.4%, return on asset 2%. Everything is a metric. They have not given comparison with previous year, which is the bad news part. On a comparative basis, Q4 of this year, the consolidated profit is 176 billion. It was 172 billion, which is hardly any growth. Profit after tax, 0.9% quarter on quarter growth. 165 billion now compared to 163.7 billion. Extrapolated, you will get about 4 to 5 percent growth for the year. One thing to note is the numbers, though it they sound, one thing to note is the numbers already sound low, but they include 1.15 billion dollars worth of stake sale in HDFC Credela. If you account for this sale, this is nearly 9,000 crore rupees. Yes, it's mentioned here, 95.53, so 9,553 crore rupees, which is one time addition to their balance sheet. It will not be there in the next quarter and next year. So the results which already look bad are actually worse.
one very interesting tax jugglery HDFC has done is if you look the tax is roughly in the range of 25% till June this is pre-merger all quarters then post merger it becomes 17 percent probably the tax rate drops because of the banking thing in this quarter minus one percent i need to dig deeper into this but this number which is net profit leading to an eps for the quarter of 23.2 would have been lot lot lower had the complete tax been paid it doesn't seem that a lot of extra tax was paid here this seems more like a refund or maybe a deferred tax which means the tax may be paid next quarter or sometime in future when there is a bumper profit this could be a very carefully crafted number to boost the eps otherwise the stock could hit a lower circuit tomorrow this number could be that bad overall the english part of the results the gross numbers may look fine but if you scratch one layer below the surface then there is a lot which is not right in my opinion the bank is not doing very well in terms of the core business. The only way it is sitting reasonably pretty right now is HDFC has come to its rescue. There are a lot of numbers coming from the businesses owned by HDFC, but the core bank is not doing that well. Maybe that was the reason why this merger was crafted because it was known that the HDFC bank part is not doing well and a mechanism was required to do the rescue. And that is perhaps the reason why FIIs have been reducing their stake significantly. Now, one thing I wonder at times is if FIIs can see this and that is one of the reasons they are exiting, what is that that the DIIs are not seeing? Your money is being invested by DIIs. FIs are selling, DIs are buying. Do give it a thought. This is my analysis. If you disagree with something, do let me know in the comment. I'll try and dig deeper and answer your question. But do tread with caution. But do tread with caution. Not too many people do so much of analysis on the stocks. So tomorrow, my general expectation is that the stock will open higher. But then gradually, a lot of analyst reports will start coming. People will do the analysis. And FIs will probably start selling. Then at that point, the stock may come under pressure. Somewhere around 11, 12 or maybe lunchtime. The numbers and my analysis are suggesting that the results are not that good. Primarily based upon the numbers from the core business. All businesses outside core businesses seem to be firing on all cylinders. Hope this analysis was useful and the weekend is treating you kindly. Thanks for watching.